Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Uh, I uh, uh, told uh, uh, the board that I would accept only if they gave me a chance to speak. Uh, because, uh, uh, those of you who know me, I know that uh, it's hard to keep me from speaking when I have a, a microphone uh, in the room. Uh, the only reason, the only justification for giving an award like this, uh, at least in my case, is that these kinds of awards remind us uh, that our profession and the lawsuits that we bring uh, can and do make a difference uh, in the fight against uh, injustice. So I thought I would talk tonight uh, for a few minutes about two lawyers from the last century whom I've always admired, whose names are pretty much largely forgotten now, but who are very good illustrations, I think, of the kind of work that lawyers uh, can do and continue to do to make our nation a better place. And the first one I want to mention is uh, a man named Louis Marshall. He was a founder of the American Jewish Committee in uh, 1906, and he argued more cases in the U.S. Supreme Court than any other lawyer of his generation. In 1923, he became uh, a director of the NAACP, and four years later, he argued one of his most important cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, a case called Nixon against Herndon. Now, Nixon was a black lawyer, uh, African-American lawyer in El Paso. And he was prevented from voting in the Democratic primary because Texas had a statute that said, in no event shall a Negro be eligible to participate in a Democratic Party primary election. Dr. Nixon sued for damages after he'd been turned away, turned away from the polling place. The district court dismissed the case, and Lewis Marshall, his lawyer, took the case to the Supreme Court and won. Justice Holmes wrote for the court, it seems hard to imagine a more direct and obvious infringement of the 14th Amendment. And that case was very important for its specific holding relating to uh, voting rights, but it was even more uh, important for the possibilities that it opened, because it had only been about 30 years since the court had decided uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, which was the notorious case from the late 1800s in which the court had upheld the constitutionality of that Louisiana statute that uh, required segregation in public transportation, in the, in the rail cars in, uh, in particular. So 30 years later, uh, everyone thought that Plessy, and it did, wasn't just thinking, Plessy had really uh, put the damper on any kind of hope that the 14th Amendment could ever be used to fight uh, racial segregation in our society. But Nixon, Louis Marshall's case, pointed in a different direction. And it suggested that there were ways in which litigation could be used to fight racial injustice. And in the years that followed, the NAACP began a strategy of building on that Nixon case by chipping away at segregation. And in the next quarter century, it brought cases against all white juries, against segregated law schools, against restricted covenants in real estate deeds, uh, segregation in interstate buses. It won all of those, and they were all building blocks toward what happened in 1954, uh, the great uh, school desegregation decision of Brown and Board of Ed. And it was Louis Marshall who helped get that ball rolling in, uh, in, in 1927 uh, by using litigation to fight racial injustice. And the second lawyer I want to mention is Hayden Covington. In 1939, he became general counsel to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he went on to argue 44 cases in the Supreme Court, including the flag salute case, in which he challenged a West Virginia regulation that not only required public school students to pledge allegiance to the flag, but it required them to raise their right hand with their palms turned upward when they recited the flag salute. Covington persuaded the U.S. Supreme Court to overrule a decision that it had issued just three years earlier and to hold that that regulation violated the First Amendment rights of students not to salute the flag. Government cannot prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, uh, the court said in that case. Now that opinion came out in 1943, when this country was deeply in war, victory was by still a long way off, and it took courage for the Supreme Court in that year to remind Americans of the values that they were fighting for in that war, and to do it in a case, moreover, involving the Jehovah's Witnesses, people who were the object of enormous public and official scorn at that time. 
including here in Oregon, just one year after uh, the uh, Plagslu case was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, the Oregon Supreme Court decided a case involving a Jehovah's Witness, a woman who'd been convicted for allowing her 10-year-old daughter to sell religious literature on the streets of Portland, and it violated a Portland City child labor ordinance. The Oregon Supreme Court upheld the conviction. But I think what was even more alarming about that case was the brief, the uh, appellant's brief, the appellee's brief, yeah, yeah the appellee's brief, doesn't matter, uh, the brief <laughs> filed by the city of Portland, the city of Portland city attorney. It was an extraordinary brief that was just one long diatribe against the Jehovah's Witnesses. Patriotic Americans, the city said, must feel that the Jehovah's Witnesses have forfeited all privileges under our Constitution, and that firm action should be taken to stop their work of undermining our government. And it's amazing that public officials in 1944 could feel so confident in their prejudice that they could brazenly put it in their, in their appellate briefs in the, in the Oregon Supreme Court. And it's equally amazing that in the year 2012, Public officials still have to be reminded about that West Virginia flag salute case. Last fall, the ACLU learned that a grade school in Leedsport, Oregon, has for years been requiring its students to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, in direct violation of the Supreme Court decision, and not only that, in direct violation of an Oregon statute. And it wasn't until the ACLU, Kevin Diaz is back there, not until the ACLU sent a rather pointed letter to the uh, superintendent down in Weedsport a couple of months ago, and not until then did the principal of Highland Elementary School decide that maybe he ought to start obeying the law. So Louis Marshall's voting rights case, Hayden Covington's flag suit case, <coughs> illustrate the difference that lawyers can make in fighting injustice. But those cases also illustrate how important it is who sits on the U.S. Supreme Court. Judges aren't blank slates when they come to the court. They bring to them the assumptions about what is good and true and just and right that they have accumulated because of where they were born, where they were educated, what books they read, who they associated with. So when the court was asked in 1905 whether a state could prevent a business owner from requiring his employees to work more than 10 hours a day, the answer that those judges gave was, of course not. The state can't interfere with a man's right to run his own business. The Constitution protects his right to have his workers work 10, 12, 15 hours a day. The members of the Supreme Court at that time were men of property, and it was unthinkable to them that the Constitution would not protect the values that were important to men of property. But when a similar case, a similar issue had come before the Supreme Court just 30 years before, the court was asked if a state could prevent a woman from practicing law, the answer that those justices gave, well, of course it can. The Constitution does not protect a woman's right to make a living. They were men of property, you see, these judges. And it was unthinkable to them that the Constitution would protect a woman's right to do much of anything. The rights that were at stake in those two cases were very similar, the right to make a living, the right to run your own business. But the judges who decided them, all men, all white, all privileged, all upper class, those men were unwilling to extend to another group, a powerless group, the rights that they took for granted for themselves. But a remarkable thing began to happen in the U.S. Supreme Court in the late 1930s. A group of justices joined the court who began to be able to see beyond the values and the interests of their own class and status in life and to understand that maybe the Constitution pr should protect the rights of people who had other values and other interests. Political dissenters, racial and religious minorities, criminal defendants, eventually even women, eventually even gays and lesbians. And in its decisions affecting all these groups, the court wasn't creating any new rights, it was ex simply extending the same rights that they had always taken for granted, always been taken for granted by white males, they were extending those same rights to other groups who were not rich, who were not white, who were not male and privileged and comfortable. In more recent times, unfortunately, we are beginning to hear, not just beginning, we have heard plenty of echoes of the old pattern that's re-emerged. 
It was a dark day in American legal history 40 years ago in January 1972 when William Rehnquist was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was a dark day because his appointment planned for the court to begin to move away from the role it had played since the late 1930s, the role of the protector of the powerless. And when Reagan and the two Bushes entered the White House, each new appointment pushed the court further and further toward the Rehnquist vision of a court whose role it is to protect the powerful, not to protect the powerless. These justices regard litigation not as a tool for fighting wrongs and fighting injustice, but as a nuisance that puts unfair burdens on defendants. These justices have abandoned long-standing criteria for dismiss dismissing federal court claims. They've raised burdens of proof. They've erected new barriers for discrimination claims. They've limited punitive damage awards. They've allowed businesses to require consumers and employees to waive their rights even to go in through the courthouse door. And these changes have all come at a real price for workers, consumers, anyone else who has tried to use litigation to protect their rights. And if you are a betting person, you will rarely lose money if you bet that in the next case involving a corporation that comes before the U.S. Supreme Court, regardless of what the subject matter will be, the corporation will win. You may have heard that this year is an election year. <laughs> next year, Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg turns 80, and Justices Scalia and Kennedy turn 77. It matters who gets appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's something I never forget when I mark my ballot for President of the United States. I'm glad the American Constitution Society is here to try to help influence the appointment uh, process. And I'm very grateful tonight to be receiving from the Oregon chapter, the Oregon Lawyers chapter, this uh, the Hans Lindy Award. It's a particular honor to be receiving it uh, when Justice Lindy himself uh, is in the room. I feel like a pygmy in the presence of a giant. But I thank the ACS board uh, for giving me the award, and I thank you for your kind attention.